Okay, good day, Dr. Sanjay Sanyal, Professor, Department Chair. So this is a dissection of the right side, supine cadaver. I'm standing on the right side, my camera person is also on the right side, towards the head end. So we have completely opened out axilla, the right arm, right cubital fossa, to show the neurovascular structures and the muscles. So this muscle that we see in front of us, this is the coracobrachialis. This takes origin from the coracoid process and it gets inserted onto the medial side of the middle of the humerus. This muscle that we see here, this is the biceps brachii. Incidentally, this is the reflected pectoralis major. Let's come back. This is the biceps brachii. This is the, these are the two heads of the biceps brachii. This is the short head taking origin from the coracoid process. And this is the long head which goes inside the tunnel produced by the transverse humeral ligament. And the long head then takes origin from the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. And these two then unite to form the belly of the biceps, and we can see the biceps tendon is coming down here, and the tendon is getting inserted here. This is the tendon getting inserted in the cubital fossa on the radial tuberosity. And as it gets inserted, there may be a bursa underneath. At the same time, we can also see that it is giving this aponeurotic expansion medially, which we have cut. This is the medial side, and this is the other cut portion of the aponeurotic expansion on this side. This is the biceps aponeurosis. The biceps aponeurosis reinforces the roof of the cubital fossa and also reduces the pressure of the biceps tendon on the radial tuberosity. Once we reflect this biceps, we see the next muscle underneath. This is the brachialis. The brachialis takes origin from the anterior surface of the humerus and it descends down, forms part of the floor of the cubital fossa and it gets inserted onto the anterior surface of the coronoid process of the ulna. This is the musculocutaneous nerve that we can see here, coming from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. I have lifted it up. It enters the arm at the point of insertion of the coracobrachialis. And therefore, this coracobrachialis muscle is referred to as a landmark muscle because it indicates the location of the entry of the musculocutaneous nerve as well as the site of the nutrient artery to the humerus. The musculocutaneous then supplies the coracobrachialis and then it runs between the biceps and the brachialis as we can see here and then it supplies both these muscles and then it comes out between the two laterally and it becomes known as the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. If there's injury to the musculocutaneous nerve which is not very common but can happen then there will be paralysis of the flexors of the elbow namely the biceps and the brachialis. However in which case the patient will still be able to weakly flex the elbow by virtue of the brachioradialis which is supplied by the radial nerve. I want to mention a few, another clinical correlation pertaining to the biceps. The biceps has got two heads. As I mentioned, this is the long head. The long head can rupture in old age due to degenerative wear and tear, in which case the rest of the biceps will bunch down here and there will be a hollow in this region when the patient tries to flex the arm. And this is referred to as pop eye deformity, which can be seen in certain people in old age. This is a clinical picture of a patient that the author attended to showing pop eye deformity. The next muscle that we can see here in the cubital fossa is this one here. This is the pronator teres. This forms the intromedial boundary of the cubital fossa and this muscle that we see here, this is the brachioradialis which forms the infralateral boundary of the cubital fossa. So having mentioned these muscles, now let's take a quick look at the neurovascular structures. Let's start with the superficial most vein that we can see here which we have preserved very carefully. This vein that we see here, this is the cephalic vein. This is formed on the rad radial side of the arm, forearm, and as it ascends up, it runs in the deltopectoral groove, namely the groove between the deltoid and the pectoralis major. This is the deltoid muscle. And then it opens, goes through the deltopectoral triangle or the clavipectoral triangle and pierces the clavipectoral fascia or the costocorocate membrane, and it opens into the axillary vein, and we can see that here. As it's running up, it gives a communication across the roof of the cubital fossa, which we can see here. This is the median cubital vein, which communicates with the basilic vein, and that we can see here very clearly. This is the basilic vein, which runs on the medial side of the arm. This basilic vein then runs up, and it unites with the vena comitantes of the brachial artery, and it ultimately forms the axillary vein, which we can see here. This basilic vein is accompanied by this nerve, which we can see here, 
This is the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and further down it is the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and we can see it is coming out from the medial cord of the brachial plexus. While we are talk talking about the nerves accompanying the superficial vein, let me mention that the cephalic vein is also accompanied at part of the distance by this nerve here. I have reflected the brick biceps to show this nerve here. This is the terminal part of the musculocutaneous nerve. The musculocutaneous nerve, after it is supplied, the coracobrachialis, the biceps and the brachialis, we can see it is running between the two and then it becomes cutaneous and it becomes known as the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm and in this place it is accompanied by the cephalic vein. The clinical significance of this is that this vein is quite often used by the nurses and other people for venesection and venipuncture. And in so doing, if there is extravasation of blood, it can produce irritation and numbness, tingling, paresthesia along the distribution of this lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which is the terminal branch of the musculocutaneous nerve. Likewise, the spacelic vein is also used for venesection and venipuncture. And if there is extravasation of blood, it can produce irritation of the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Now let's take a look at other structures in the cubital fossa. Going from medial to lateral, we have this structure here. This is the median nerve. And we can see that the median nerve is formed in the axilla by the lateral root of the median nerve and the medial root of the median nerve, coming respectively from the lateral cord and the medial cord. And the two unite to form the median nerve. Medial nerve initially is lateral to the axillary artery. It then crosses in front and then it becomes medial to the brachial artery in the cubital fossa. After the median nerve, we have the next structure here. This is the brachial artery. The brachial artery is the downward continuation of the axillary artery. We can see this muscle here. This is the teres major. So therefore, after the teres major, the axillary artery becomes known as the brachial artery. And my finger is tracing it. This brachial artery runs just lateral to the median nerve in the cubital fossa. These two structures, the median nerve and the brachial artery, can be injured in supracondylar fracture of the humerus in children as well as anterior dislocation of the elbow, which is also quite common in children, in which case we have to reduce them immediately, otherwise there will be jeopardization of the blood supply and or the nerve supply to the distal part of the arm. The next structure I have already mentioned is the tendon of the biceps. And finally, if I retract the brachioradialis, we can see this nerve here, which I am going to lift up now, this nerve. This is the radial nerve. The radial nerve comes from in front of the lateral epicondyle, and here under the brachioradialis, it divides into a superficial division, which runs under the brachioradialis, and the deep division, which we can see continuing here. This is the deep portion of the radial nerve which supplies not only the brachioradialis, but it also supplies the muscles on the extensor aspect of the forearm. So therefore, in the cubital fossa, the structures from medial to lateral are the median nerve, the brachial artery, the biceps tendon, and the radial nerve. The boundary is, the superior boundary is an imaginary line joining the medial epicondyle, where my right index finger is located, and the lateral epicondyle, where my left index finger is located. This is the superior boundary. The inframedial boundary is the pronator teres and the infralateral boundary is the brachioradialis. And this median nerve, as it pro progresses down, it goes through the two heads of the pronator teres, namely the humor and the, and the ulnar head, where it can get entrapped to produce the condition known as pronator syndrome, where the patient will have pain in the cubital fossa and numbness and tingling in the distribution of the median nerve. So these are some of the clinical correlations pertaining to the arm and the elbow. Thank you very much for watching. Dr. Sanjay Sanyal signing out. David O is the camera person. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day.